Hi, I'm Rob Cosm. Welcome to my shop. Episode number 124. I think. 124? Yeah. No, 24. 24. Uh, skipping ahead. <laughs> we might still be there. So I want you to, I want you to see. I'm going to show you this. Before we go look at a piece of furniture, I found another drawer. And I want you to tell me what you think. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Instead of getting excited about her horses, I think this is one of the coolest things. So, if you, yeah, I'm sure you've seen this before. There's a drawer right there. I know you can't see it. I have to use a piece of tape for a fancy... Oh, come on now. Oh, I thought that was going to be my... There. Okay. Now, I just think that uh, that is... Sweet. I haven't got door. I haven't decided on the handles yet. But when you close those, they disappear. The grain goes right in. Now that one's got to be closed a little bit more so that it'll. You see a little bit of a shadow right there. Tell me in the comment section what you think when you see something like that. See if you're crazy as I am. Okay, let's come over here. So I'm having to go around and rob furniture from people that I'd given it to. This is my parents. This is a um, little cherry ta uh, ch shaker style cherry table. Um, this was done entirely with hand tools. This was a project in our hand tool workshop. I think it was third, third or fourth. This was the first project we did using hardwood. We did, uh, we did the candle box out of pine. Yeah, and then we did the bookcase out of pine. And then we did this one out of cherry. So, um, I, I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit about it. I, I try to pay a lot of attention to proportions. And I see a lot of people make this type of thing. It's fairly popular. But the legs always look, in my opinion, they look too heavy. I like them to be just sized right. Now, there's a taper. Starts right here and goes down. I can't remember what. I think it's 5 eighths of an inch square on the end. A little chamfer on the outside, on all, all the way around. Uh, the top, I, unfortunately, my mother has had something sitting right there. So you can see that where the, uh, the, uh, the cherry has oxidized on the outside. It's almost gone blonde and still has a little bit of the red on the inside. Don't know what that mark is right there. And then another thing too is I often see this is too bulky looking. I've got that reduced to about a quarter of an inch. So then you have a slight taper on the underside. Now I'm gonna turn it upside down so you can see what I did on the bottom. Frame is made out of pine. Again, I instead of cutting it or leaving it smooth, I've got a little bit of scallop shape to that coming off of the scrub plane. Actually, that was probably my round bottom plane that I did that with. Now the drawer. The drawer operates really nicely. It's nice and smooth. I, used, I actually used a metal drawer pull. So we take this out. Anything interesting about the case? The sides run the same direction as the drawer, which is uh, good for expansion. If you look in there, all of the tenons, this is joined to the leg by a tenon, are pinned. That's what that dowel is on both sides. You don't see it quite as dark there and back there. Rather than see it from the outside, I didn't want it to show. So you have a typical frame in the bottom with, a, with that pine panel. Up underneath, uh, what I've done here is I've attached the lid at the top to the frame. Frame is nice and stable, doesn't move. But I used, uh, in the middle, it's, it's screwed on. Um, do you ever remember the name of that company that makes those screws with the big washer already attached to them? Shoot. They do a bunch of stuff we buy. Dang it, I can't remember. So this screw and this screw, which are at the halfway point, are in a hole in the frame, same diameter as the screw. This screw, this screw, and the two back ones are in larger diameter holes in this piece so that there's room inside for it to move seasonally. The big washer out here is what keeps it nice and tight and allows that to slip. I really like this piece. So cherry door front, drawer front, uh, this was actually a traditional half blind. In fact, I was going to say it was the first time we taught them half blinds, but it wasn't. Um, aspen on the sides, back. Native, native cedar, some that we actually milled ourselves. We went and this cedar, if you go, we did a video once, a uh, trip to a lumber mill or something, and we a actually day, went out. I think it was a day at the mill. 
A day at the mill, right. Check that one out. I'll, I'll put that in a link. So we cut down the tree, took it to the uh, took it and milled it up with his uh, bandsaw mill or portable mill and then dried it. I actually had him specifically cut the stuff to 5 8 thickness so he wouldn't have to waste a ton. You know, you buy three-quarter stock and you're going to take it down to five, uh, just under 3 8 There's an awful lot of waste, so cut it, rough it at 5 8 You're not throwing away as much wood. Drawer tails run wild on the back side. Single screw, brass screw allowing for movement, trapped on three sides, glued along the front. Um, and I, I burned in my name, but then I signed it up on top with a wood pen. The dovetails look the dovetails look really good. I'm going to show you a mistake, or I'm going to show you an error. You can get close on that. I wouldn't say an error. We'll call it a uh, a flaw. So I, I harp on people to keep that chisel standing plumb when you're cutting the baseline, especially on drawers, because the drawers end up being proud, and then you have to plane down through. And if you have undercut the back of the baseline, as you start to remove top material, instead of having it a nice plumb wall, it's tapered back like this, and eventually things like that happen. So you see that mark right there at the end of my finger where it's starting to show the gap that would be there? Mm -hmm. Actually, truth be known, and I know, my, I, I know my work well enough, that that was not from undercutting. That was fracture, fibers that fractured, and I probably wasn't either my sharp chisel wasn't sharp enough or I wasn't using my 17 degree, which would prevent that from occurring. You don't notice it at first glance anyway. No drawer stop in this one. And typically people aren't gonna, you know, they're not gonna pull it out much farther than that anyway. Unless it's kids. And I'm just listening to this. So it's, it, it's hitting right here. And what needs to happen is I need to go in there. I've already done it once, but I need to do a little bit more. And with the plane, I just take a slight pass, so I make a very shallow chamfer right here, so that instead of it hitting that hard square edge, this hits on a very shallow chamfer and just rides up in, and no problem. Cute little piece. Really like it. Wish I had it at home. Okay, my knees. Now, here's the, ba uh, not the bad news, here's the challenging news. So come over here. I've been wanting to, I, when I built this, and you'd have to go in and join our, actually you can do that and for free, at least for the month. When we built this, I experimented with the way that I did this. I'd never built a set of drawers this way before, and I don't think I would again after all the trouble I've had. And I did everything possible to prevent this from happening, but it still did. So, Jake, zero right in on that. You see that ridge right there? Flush up here, and then right down here, all of a sudden you have... Actually, that, actually just a yeah. second. I'm going to use my chisel and see if I can... Hear that? Slides over it up here. Starting right there, it actually hits it. Well, the problem is, in order to fit this drawer the way I want, I've got to allow for that, which means I'm going to have to take material off the side of the drawer, which means when it closes, you're going to have this gap out here. Don't want that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this thing all apart. I haven't glued it up yet. I'm going to sand it on its edge on my bench. I'm going to use this plane. This is a... Uh, this is a Lee Nelson 10 and a quarter. I'll show you how to set it up, sharpen it. And because it's this way, we'll be able to do it. We're going to plane in this direction. I'm going to go in, and I'm going to do my darndest to get rid of that. I'll take it as far back as I can get because I can't go right to the end with this. And then I'll pick it up from there. I'll pick it up with this plane, which will get me you know, within... Uh, an inch and a half on the end, and then the rest of it, I'll go in and I'll use my chisel plane. I think I've shown you this before. My chisel plane to finish it off. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect back in there because by the time your drawer, by the time your, your, time your drawer gets there, you've got enough contact along the side 
that if we lose some of that side-to-side contact in the back, you're not going to notice it. You're not going to start all of a sudden getting a loose-fitting drawer because it's was it we took a little too much material off that very back end. But I don't I don't want to have to deal with that. This is flush on that side. That's sticking out there. Have no idea what happened or why it's there. So what I got to do, I got to get my bench cleaned off. I got to get something to lay on there to protect it. I got to secure that, clamp it somehow in place, and then uh, we'll tackle it. So give me a minute to get everything put away before we take this task on. Okay. So first plane we're going to use, and blow the dust off this, is a ten and a quarter. So this was called a carriage maker's plane, or bench rabbit plane. It was the Lee Nielsen version, patterned after the Stanley ten and a quarter. The ten and a half was very similar, except it didn't have tilting handles. So the nice thing about this plane is, if you were working into a vertical surface, you could tilt your handles over and not bust your knuckles. See that? And get right into a vertical surface. I'm going to use it straight up and down because I don't have any room for my knuckles on either side. The only difficult part about this is getting this stupid blade back in. Or out. Or out. It is a son of a gun. In fact, I usually end up... I can do it. I know it happens. I've done it before, but I'll just take the screw out. Now that should have made it easier. Come on. Now, it's raining cats and dogs if you can hear it. But it's not snow. We like ice, we don't like snow. You know, we need to show them before the end. It, this is over as uh, our maple syrup. Oh, shoot. This is my... Uh, high angle. This is my high angle one. I, I'm going to change that. Now, so what I did here... I'm assuming you guys don't already know this, so for those of you who do, just fast forward. So I use these when I make drawer bottom plan drawer bo uh, dovetail markers. And I end up with a long strip of wood. I'll show you a short version. Um, Jake, do you any idea where they are? Oh well, if you can imagine a long piece of wood cut into the shape of a T, if I can find it, it'll be just quick and easy to show you. If not, it's going to be very difficult. And I guess the latter is true, it's going to be difficult. Anyway, you've got, you got to plane this long strip. Show them a dovetail marker. Uh, there's what a dovetail marker looks like. So I, I get a long strip of wood, if you can imagine, because terribly unsafe to try to process that. Get a long strip of wood and I've got a gwin and I've got a plane right into the corner here, here, here and here to get rid of all the saw marks. And the grain changes direction and the whole bit. So you either deal with nice and clean and torn area, nice and clean, torn area, or you put a 20 degree back bevel. If you, Jake gets in there close, you can see that. It's a 20 degree back bevel and it's about, how, how wide is it? Any idea? Might be a, it's not quite a sixteenth. Doesn't need to be any more than that. So now the frog holds the blade at 45 degrees, but because you've got a 20 degree back bevel here, you're actually planing at 65 degrees. I mean, it almost eliminates any tearing, as long as the blade's sharp, of course, but it's very difficult to push. So great in that application. I don't want it in this application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace it. I know I have a, uh, I know I've got a standard angle. Give me a second to dig through this. This could take a minute. Okay, this is the original Lee Nelson blade. This one just has uh, the standard um, normal back bevel we put on the Charlesworth ruler trick. So I'm on my 500 grit, I should say. I'm going to start calling this Jake's 500 grit stone. And this isn't any different than anything else, except I'm not going to fit, well... I don't normally feather the edges. And I actually, I don't think I will this time either. Because the reason I don't do that is because typically you're using this plane 
to maintain that flat surface right into the corner. So you don't want feathering that would leave a little raised surface as you got to the corner. Find your primary. Come up a few degrees. Spend approximately 10 seconds. Light to moderate downward pressure. Fingers distributing that pressure as uniformly as possible. Wrists and elbows locked until you can detect a slight burr on the back side of the blade. And I didn't. In fact, let's just, just go ahead and do this. Come over here and I'll show you what I'm, what I'm thinking. See how big my, my secondary bevel has gotten? So I'm going to come in, I'm going to regrind. And what I'm doing is setting up my tool rest. So I'm just going to spin that by hand. Okay, so there you can see where my marks are. And that's pretty much right in the middle. If you were to divide that primary bevel, it's almost in the middle. Now, I'm using a Wolverine grinding jig. We sell these because it will convert a junk grinder into a great grinder. Attaches to the bench so it doesn't have to fit the grinder. And it's nice, big, solid, dandy. And I'm using a CBN wheel. This is one that we had custom made. It's 80 grit. The coarsest we could find elsewhere was 120. And because you're working on the primary bevel, which never actually touches the wood, you don't need it to be a uh, smooth surface. You simply want to get metal out of the way that will allow you to more conveniently put your micro bevels on there. So you just keep flipping this over. Now again, this is another one of those planes you don't have a lot of lateral adjustment when that's sitting in the plane. So you've got to keep that pretty close to being square. What I love about this, that's barely what I would call lukewarm. So you got two things going on. You got this big hunk of steel absorbing the heat. You got this massive tool rest, which is a quarter of an inch thick, also acting as a heat sink. And of course the sparks dissipate some of the heat as well. But on a normal grinding wheel, I would have already had to dip this blade probably three times. I can hold it. It's not, it's, it's warm. It's probably even, I don't know, I was going to say hot, but it really wasn't. I wouldn't have been able to hold it if it was. Flip that over and see what's going on. Yeah, I could use a little more work right in the middle. Another nice thing about the CBN wheel, you never have to dress it. You never have to balance it when you put it on the first time. It's, it's just a big hunk of steel that is ready to go as soon as you mount it and turn the thing on. Now if this did get hot, you can just hold it here for a second and the tool rest will cool it down, but this does not need any of that. If you've done any amount of grinding yourself, you'd know that to be able to grind this whole blade and not have to dip, dip it to cool it is uh, highly irregular. Now I don't want to go all the way through. I just want to shorten the primary, the secondary so that I don't have as much metal to move when I go in and create it a new secondary bevel on the uh, course of the two stones. Now I'm focusing on keeping the tool tight to this and not allowing it to ride up as I engage the wheel. So I'm putting more pressure this way than I am pushing the blade into the stone. And it's light to moderate. I mean, you can make it burn if you want to just grind it in there. No pun intended. But just light pressure on the wheel. It's close. By the way, questions always asked, do I buy 
a grinder that turns at 1725 RPM or 3450. Those are the two speeds that you typically find. And I say, you know what? Mine's variable speed, as you see, but I never change the speed. That's the least important. I would advise an 8 inch grinder because it seems today that uh, most manufacturers of accessories are catering more to 8 inch than 6 inch. Okay, that's that's pretty much there. I'll spend another 30 seconds. Had that blade been ground before? Uh, yeah, I think so. Now I'm just going to finish grinding this while I turn it off. Otherwise it'll spin for the next five minutes. Okay, so if you want a close look at that, you can see what's left of my original secondary bevel. No reason to go all the way through it, because if you do, you're going to take it out of square. I just want to pull back the secondary so I don't have to move as much material. By the way, it's also a lot easier to find your primary now that you've done that. Come up, spend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 seconds. Just starting to feel a burr. I'm going to go a little more. And I cover the whole area of the stone so as to even out the wear. Okay, now I got a good burr running all the way across. Always check it. Now on the 16,000, same thing, just elevate the blade a few degrees higher. You're only touching the very leading edge, so it doesn't take a whole lot of work. All you have to do is create a new bevel, a tertiary or a third bevel. And that essentially just means removing peaks from the uh, 500 grit scratches that were left as a result of that stone. If you can envision that in your head. Think of a, think of a, uh, show you this. Think of a saw blade. This is a little bit animated, but so after using a 60, uh, 500 grit stone, you've got measured 500 grit particles scraping the metal. <laughs> and the result of those scrapes, when it comes out to the edge, what you're looking at is that, right? I know it's not exact, but come on, be with, bear with me. And what you're going to do now is you're going to set that down, and because that edge is straight and these stones are flat, when you set a straight edge down on a flat surface, then it's going to touch over its entire length. Well, what's actually touching are just the points of these scratches or these peaks created by the scratches. So then when you step over here, as long as you elevate a degree or two higher, it's only the points that are touching and you simply have to wear away the points until you create, you know, my, my saw has a much finer edge with little wee tiny 16,000 grit scratches. They're still there, but they're so small that they're not detectable when you plane the surface and feel it. Last step, steel rule, Charlesworth ruler trick on the edge of the stone. Always keep it in the same spot and always use the same, the same uh, ruler. On the other side, stay within a quarter of an inch of the edge, three fingers to distribute this pressure as evenly as you can, and go in there and work that. Okay, that's it. Now comes the hard part, getting this dumb thing back in there without wrecking it. Make sure there's no moisture on there. You don't want it to rust. Okay, put my chip breaker on. And I want that to be, I don't get all worked up about it like some. I'm about a 32nd of an inch away. Snug that up, and it needs to be tight. That's our screwdriver we sell. It's ugly, but you can get a lot of torque. It's a, And it's got that nice big thick tip that when you put it in there, it makes good contact. 
we wrap it like a hockey stick so that you can actually get a hold of it. I've seen, I've got screwdrivers that have beautiful handles, but the problem is you can't, they're so slippery, you can't, you can't uh, really apply the torque you need. Now look at that. Told you it was easy. Put this back in. Put the lever cap on. Cock it. Now you want a screwdriver like this in particular, especially if you have brass screws on your plane because a, a traditional screwdriver will wreck those lips of the uh, slot. All right, flip that around. Wipe one way, need you ask why. Uh, I don't usually use orange. Now what I'm doing is I'm sighting down there. I can see blade only on the left, none on the right. So lateral adjustment lever gets pushed toward the left. And that will skew that blade around. It actually pulled it all the way in. And I went too far, so I'll go back the other way. Okay, now the blade appears to be parallel to the sole. I'm going to retract it just to get it down below the surface. Now that blade is always wider. Anytime you have a rabbiting plane, shoulder plane, rabbit plane, um, that one, the, um, the blade is always going to be wider than the body of the plane so that you can come in and you can adjust it to the side you're gonna work against. And I'm gonna work against my right side. So I set it down like that, push it down hard, and now that blade will be flush with this side. The problem is that it may have thrown it out of uh, parallel. It did. It was off quite, it was out quite a bit anyway, so. Meaning it was sticking out there quite a ways. I'm going to do it again. Now, it's going to be an awkward planing job. So rather than try to do this in there, I'm going to get a piece of lumber. We got anything short, Jake, so I don't have to yeah. move what? Where's There's that, that big piece right there. Right there. Uh. The other one. Uh, that's all the other one. Up. Wait, where's that big hunk of pine that we were using to chop on? Magic wax. Shameless commercial. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm actually. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go in here, and I'm going to. Uh, there, true that up. Now I can go in with this and check it. Okay, I'm pulling heavy on my right, so a little movement. That moved a little easier than I want. Still a little heavy on my right. Still a little heavy on my right. Okay, that's better. Now, so I'm, I don't know what that gouge is right there. Something's been on the side of, I actually have no idea where that came from, unless I did that when I went in there trying to fix the, uh, that part. So what I need to do is I need to keep this plane tight up against here. I need to catch that shaving right there. You know what? Just hold on a second. I did this the other day and I ripped my arms all to shred on that sharp edge. So I'm going to put a piece of I'm going to put a piece of uh, tape on both sides. It may s prevent a little bit of No, I'm going to be up here far enough that the plane doesn't get interfered with. Good. So 
same thing on the other side. Come on. Okay. It's not going to move. Shouldn't take a whole lot. Actually, tilt this just a little bit. This is, uh, this is going to be a bit tedious, so look in there. I left the shaving. I can't see it. I can't see that. Want me to send some light? Wait, this on? Huh? Here. No, I see it. Do you want light in there or not? I see it. Okay, so that's attached. So I'll pull that off. Now, I don't know if it's worth doing this or not. This should be sharp because I went in and sharpened it. And it's actually working flush to that side. So I'm going to go in there. Set that down. Yeah, I did pick up the shaving. Push it as far as I can take it. Now, I can just see a little bit of a ledge left now this plane this is a this is not an easy tool to use just because it's a, a real pain to set up it's flush on that side too so I'm lucking out and this will allow you to get right into the corner now I was putting some weight on the front lip or the front edge this thing dying okay still need a little bit more right there I can't have, uh, I, I gotta get this blown out. I can't have shavings that are still stuck. You know, I call them skin tags. Only way I can think of describing it. Because if you leave that in there, then the plane, the front, if you leave a skin tag on there and the plane's going in, and then see it rides up on that well then it's going to lift the blade out of the wood so no can do all right let's try this again now i've got to stay tight to that wall or that runner that was good Okay, now I lose it there, and then I pick it up farther in. Oh yeah. Still got a little bit, I think. I'm going to use the chisel. Rest it. Yeah, another pass. 
Now, this lame. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in there. I'm gonna go in there. And I'm gonna use just just the uh, chisel plane. I think. Like I said, that's far enough in that it really isn't going to impact the fit of the drawer. really tell this thing have rechargeable oh, just a second let me get my good one okay I don't want to leave any kind of a ridge in there and I'm just I'm feeling for it and I got the little one I got a little one down there, but you know what? It's really not bad. I think I'll take another pass here first because I think I can finish this off with one more. What's the matter? So when I'm doing this, I got to get that blade in beyond the cherry before I set it down. I don't want to engage in the cherry. Now I'm having to push down and twist this way I would never have been able to do this. You know what? Feel that, Jake. What do you think? Flush? That's good. Yeah, I don't know what that is. But that's good. Got a little bit of a ridge right there I might... I might try to take. So my last step is to go in there and uh, okay I can feel it shoot I don't like dropping it like that that'll change the setting well it can be so hard to keep that engaged meaning engaged in the wood. It doesn't look bad. And I think it's going to be all right. Now, I've got a little bit of a ridge right there. Funny, well, I guess there is. There's just a tiny bit right there. I'm going to try going in and taking one pass. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to push this down on this side. Got to go back in, and I got to I got to resurface my test piece or my calibrating piece. You don't want to be discovering whether or not this works inside there. Not way too heavy on the right, left. Sorry. Still too heavy on the left. Still too heavy on the left. Already taken off too much. I'll recalibrate. Hit it twice. Have I got enough planes out here? Come on now, still too heavy on the left. Still 
still too heavy on the left. Another. Okay, need a little more blade. Went a little bit too far. Too far. Come on. Talk to your planes. It's like plants. They respond better. I'm way out of whack. Shoot. Drive it over. No. Nope. Then bring it back. Okay, why am I not getting that the way I want? So before I can set it flush with this side, I've got to bring it all the way over. Okay, so now it's, it's sticking out here. Then put it down here and shove it over. Oh, I know why. Shoot. Got to go through this again. The chip breaker is, is over too far on one side. So it's the chip breaker that is uh, moving and keeping the blade. We're at 42. Okay. See, I got I had the chip breaker over too far, so when I was I was the chip breaker was pushing over, and then the blade wouldn't sit. Where I want it. Come on, sit down, sit down, sit down. Snug that up. Okay, we gotta go through this process again, but you know what? It's what it takes. I, uh, I read uh, most of your comments. How else would I know what it is you want? Appreciate the feedback. I think I won in our survey. I read more comments saying film it all than I did saying be selective. Too much blade, pull it in. 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 Still. I have a very small problem. I want a very small solution. Okay, now we got to go a little bit to the left. Okay. So all we're trying to do is get rid of that little ridge right there. So we're going to do the same thing. I didn't mean to bang that. When I shift my weight, I lose contact between the wood, uh, the plane, the blade, and the wood. Okay, I'll go in there, see if I can pick up, get my. Uh, Okay, I'm not going to mess with that anymore. It feels flush all the way around. Okay, so what's next? Fitting. I'll put this all back together, and tomorrow, this is this is today's episode, right? Tomorrow we will go back.
Tomorrow we're going live. Oh, tomorrow. So Sunday, we'll film it tomorrow, but when the next one you see, we're going to go in and we will go back to the process of fitting the drawer. Can't promise that'll happen in one episode. Rarely does. It's a finicky process, as if you haven't already realized that. Um, appreciate your feedback. Anything you can ask us, we'll try to accommodate. I want to remind you that tomorrow night, 6 o'clock Eastern Time, is our uh, weekly live. This time we are, uh, we're back to working on Angie's bed desk, to show you that real quick. Next week will be another Q&A. We'll give you instructions on how you can submit questions. So what we're going to do tomorrow, tomorrow, or hopefully we're going to assemble this. This is the back. We've got to put that in place. It's got to be pinned. We should be able to get the dovetails. We should be able to get the whole thing assembled. Then, I, do, I don't know if it's going to happen tomorrow or not, we've got to go to work on our side hung drawer. So that'll be fun. It's uh, for a great person. Angie uh, works for us. She takes care of packaging the t-shirts. All right, we will see you folks hopefully tomorrow night on the live broadcast. Have a good weekend.